Greg Hefley. This is your mother. Everything is going to be okay. On the second part of this video essay series, not review series, we're going to be talking about arguably the best Diary of a Wimpy Kid film ever made. There's only four, but you know, it's Roderick Rules. Uh, just to make it clear, I'm only here for the Continental Breakfast. That's still on, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you missed it, but... Um... I actually remember loving this film the best out of all of them when I was a kid myself. Um, I've seen most people always say that Roderick Rules is the best film, and for good reason. Them and me as a child were smart as fuck, because this movie is actually the best in my opinion. But slow down, slow down, let's not talk about the movie first. Let's talk about something that got a brand new makeover for 2020. That's right, today's sponsor, Skillshare. Sorry, you're about to get flexed on right now. Skillshare is here with a sexy new look and is taking new year, new me. Quite literally. I wasn't told to say that. That's my script. I thought it was funny. So be cool like Skillshare and start learning stuff. If you didn't know, Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives such as yourself with classes on thousands of topics. Want to make a movie better than Roderick Rules? Learn how to create a low-budget film for under $500 thanks to Julian Klepper's class. Or watch one of the most successful Skillshare classes in 2019, How to Be Productive and Organized, which is something, something I need. An annual subscription of Skillshare is less than $10 a month, which is genuinely insanely cheap, but you're welcome in advance because you're getting two free months of Skillshare Premium if you go to the link in the description below. That's right. Click the link in the description to get started on Skillshare for two months absolutely free. It's totally worth it. Definitely check them out because they're really sexy, especially now, and they help me help bring you guys Chad level content. Roderick Rules is the second film of the Diary of a Wimpy Kid franchise, and it seems that everyone loved the first film because the sequel came out a year later. Likely because of contracts, but I'll just pretend that everyone loved the film and the entire world in unison clamored for another. One thing that's interesting is that the director of the first, Tor Frudenthal, left the series, leaving David Bowers directing the sequel, and I'll be honest, the directing feels a lot better. The writing is also the best it's ever been, taking materials from Roderick Rules and The Last Straw. The film is a lot to play with, and everything that was funny in the first film is even more prominent in this one. Didn't like Fregley? Fregley is barely in this movie. Thought Roderick was great? He's pretty much the star. Loved the family drama more than the school stuff? The Hefley family is front and center. Everything that worked in the first film is doubled down here. For example, we have Chirag Gupta, a character that pretty much just spouted expository dialogue in the first film. Now, he's not only very plot relevant, similarly to the books, but the film actually calls out his expository nature for comedic effect. Who is that? Her name is Holly Hills. She just moved here. Live on the north side of town in a colder side near the park. And speaking of comedy, the comedy in this film, holy shit, it's actual gold. It's as if they put all the best ideas they had into this one film, because there's genuinely hilarious stuff in this film that could make everyone laugh. Ew. What was General Grant? doing on the thermostat? Be free, little friend. He picked the housekeeper over the supermodel? I know there's a lock on that door. Greg has walked in on me like a million times, and if there was a lock, I would use it. In fact, maybe you should put one on. Next year, I want a chocolate cake. That is if you're alive next year. And it all feels genuine. It all feels like it's there because these are the characters. This is the world and this is how they react. And a lot of it is due to, again, Zachary Gordon and his charisma and the fact that he's genuinely a kid. And he brings this childish energy into the film, which aids the film in selling the idea that these are kids trying to figure out the problems in their lives. In the Hefley house, Zach always wanted me to play hide and seek in there. Oh yeah. Every Everywhere. five Not seconds. just in the Hefley house, in the shopping mall yeah. scenes. Yeah. Oh my Everywhere. god, that was all amazing. Zach was just, oh, this place is awesome, we gotta play hide and seek in here. And I'd be like, okay. And then in, be in, in between takes, so I'd be like, Robert, cow, cow, cow. And I'd be like, okay. I'll and one of the main reasons these characters stay with you, and why this is one of those films that basically has a bit of a following, 
is because there's no point in any of the three films where you feel like these are actors and they're strangers. When Greg calls his mom, mom, you genuinely think, yep, that's his mom. This also isn't a random sequel, it actively progresses the story. Not only is Greg a bit of a better friend now, but thanks to the events of the previous film, both he and Rowley are now in the seventh grade. Seventh grader. That sounds a lot better than sixth grader. But where the film excels is its story, as surprising as that is. One would expect a kid's film to excel at the charm or its fun characters, but no. This film's plot is, and you can quote me on this, one of the best stories ever written for a kid's film. So, let's not get lost in Devin Bostick's dreamy eyes, ladies and gentlemen. The dude carries the film a good amount, but the film doesn't even really need much carrying. The plot is airtight, nearly every single thing is actually important to the story, even if it doesn't feel like it. The first film's plot felt very random and slice of lifey, but that was all in an effort to make us understand that Greg is an ass and he needs to change, which is something Greg eventually realizes as well. This film, on the other hand, has its three acts, and each ends with a massive change in the status quo as all acts should work. In simplest terms, the first act ends with Greg and Roderick having a party and having to lie about it to their parents. The two of them are now friendly with each other. Deny, deny. Deny. The second act ends with the Heffley family having a fight, and Greg and Roderick part ways, antagonizing each other even more. And then the third act ends with everyone in the family finally having a great moment together, and the brothers are now friendlier than ever before. As all this is happening, Greg is in love with Holly Hills, and it isn't just to have her around to waste time. She actually talks to Greg about how you can't change your family, helping Greg understand that his brother is someone he can ultimately end up resenting or caring about. Holly Hills is also the catalyst for many of the film's jokes, and that's great also. Not just that, Rowley is in this film too, and he wants to do a magic act with Greg for his town's talent show. The two are also really into the internet and want to become internet famous. Now, Greg gives a resounding no to the magic act because it's embarrassing. This sounds like another random moment in Greg's life, like the first film, right? But no. Actually, it serves the plot by having the film end up with Greg doing the act with Rowley anyway, in order to have his mom let Roderick play in the talent show with his band. Greg also wanted to not embarrass himself in front of Holly Hills, which ultimately shows us that he cares more about his family and friends than a girl he doesn't really know and is just crushing on, which is good. But not just that, it wraps up the Holly Hills plotline by having her say that he did a good job and that she notices him and Roderick have made up, which resolves the main plotline. And not just that, when Loaded Diaper performs at the end, the becoming online famous thing comes back because the mom dancing on stage becomes a viral sensation. Do you see what I mean? Everything is tied together. Every little thing matters. And that's genuinely awesome. Like, I'm shaking. I'm shaking right now. Greg and Roderick are perfect in this film. They are each other's foil in every way. Roderick even ruins Greg's life unknowingly, but Greg is smart enough to get his brother back as well, and every one of their interactions are relevant, making them dynamic characters, and they are active participants in shaping the story. Their interactions shape the way they think about each other and shape the way others view them. Greg's mom, Susan, creates this game, in a way, called Mom Bucks for Greg and Roderick. These are fake dollars which can be gained from her by doing a good deed for the other brother, and a mom buck can be given to her for real currency in return. You'll save up your mom bucks. Can I cash out now? I... I want to cash out. Frank? I know. And this is the catalyst of the plot of the film. The mom bucks lead Greg and Roderick to interact with one another more and more, which eventually leads to them hating each other more and more, which eventually climaxes with both brothers fighting each other in the middle of friggin' church cinema. Their constant bickering and feuding finally hits its peak when Roderick hosts a party at the Heffley home, which shows us that Roderick isn't just immature, he's also pretty insecure, which humanizes him a lot. Go ask the girls to dance. You ask them. The party sequence in the film is actually one of the best sequences in the film. It shows us the brotherly dynamic Greg and Roderick have, and it shows how one one-ups the other every single time, and ultimately it progresses the plot of the story in a very entertaining way. 
Now, throughout the film, we notice what Roderick truly wants. He wants to play with his band, load a diaper, and have people appreciate him. And I think that's what it ultimately comes down to. He wants to show people that he actually is this cool guy in a cool band, going as far as getting a good musician, albeit a lousy person, to be the lead guitarist, because this is his dream. Being a musician is everything to him, and it's actually very similar to Greg's state of mind in the first film. Both Greg and Roger come to realize the benefits and advantages of having a brother. It's someone to talk to, someone to confide in, and we get to see that more and more. What gives you worth is not only how you carry yourself, but also how you carry others. Seeing Greg and Roderick's brotherly bond deepen is the core of this film. Their relationship is the core of this film. Roderick going from annoying older brother to wise older brother is a sight to behold, and we get to see that the reason for this change is because Roderick realizes that Greg is someone he can confide in. He isn't just some younger brother he's stuck with, Greg can be a friend too. You know that girl who I sent the note to? She thinks I'm fraggly. Hey, don't take it hard. Girls act like they're not into you when they really are. One of the reasons Susan Heffley wants the boys to get along is because, well, she wants her kids to get along, but she also writes a column about how her family is pretty much perfect and how Greg and Roderick get along so well, only to have that shattered in front of her. So the film also challenges the idea of what a family is really like. No, families are not all sunshines and rainbows. It isn't about forcing your kids to be perfect, it's about rewarding them when they genuinely act selflessly. It's the simple acts of love that we should pay attention to. Steve Zahn is also hilarious in this movie and I wish he was in it more. His character is faced with the looming threat that is Bill, who is a washed up musician and he's been added to Roderick's band. Bill is an asshole and he's the representation of what Roderick could become. But we all know deep down that Roderick is a bit too smart to become like him, but we need to see what the true difference is between them. You can't go on without me. I started Loaded Diaper. I'm the backbone. That's rock and roll, bro. This finally displays what the difference is between Bill and Roderick. Loyalty. Throughout the film, one thing we notice about Roderick is that he ultimately cares. Deny, deny, deny isn't necessarily a bad thing because even though he is technically lying and hiding the truth, he's not going to rat himself or his brother out. Roderick would only betray if he feels like he's been wronged, and that's exactly what happens. What we're done today? You're out of the band! What? That's rock and roll, bro! I think at the end of the day, there's something really cathartic about that. There's a joy you get out of watching Roderick Rules. It's this satisfaction, almost. In Diary of a Wimpy Kid, we start off fine and then derail and end up happy. Meanwhile, in Roderick Rules, we start off awful, get a taste of happiness, then hit the lowest of the low, and then we're finally met with happiness again. After watching the movie, I was hit with the problem, you know, the dilemma. Which is the best casting choice? Is it Zachary Gordon as Greg or Devin Bostic as Roderick? And the truth is that I just... I don't know. Greg has to carry the movie, Zachary Gordon has to carry the movie, and you can see the issue with Zachary Gordon being replaced as Greg in Diary of Wimpy Kid 4, which is the last film of this series, and I haven't even seen it yet, but you can just tell from the trailers, as well as Roderick, you can tell from the trailers. It doesn't feel like it's these characters. And I feel like a lot of that is due to the acting of Devin Bostic and Zachary Gordon as these characters. They've truly embodied these characters, and they bring this charm to these characters that makes it feel real. I think that the plot, the writing of this film is far superior to the first, and it genuinely just came together so perfectly. I have no idea how they pulled it off. I have no idea why this has a 46% on Rotten Tomatoes. These reviewers have no idea what they're talking about. They wish they were me. Joking aside, a lot of this is nostalgia. Of course, of course a lot of this is nostalgia. I'm seeing these films nostalgically because, you know, I remember when I watched these films when I was younger, I remember reading the books when I was younger. But there is genuinely something beautiful about these films that I feel like most people would appreciate because you can tell that they're made because they want to exist. Someone wanted to tell the story. You feel that. And uh, I'm excited for part three, Dog Days. Thank you very much for watching. Outro time. Everybody dance the night away. Thanks for
for watching. Thanks for coming to the table, and we'll see you all next time. How was that? Yeah, that was cool, wasn't it? That was a great idea.